Romans chapter 8. This is our third study in this majestic chapter. And we're going to be looking very especially at verses 5 to 8. Romans 8 verses 5 to 8. Life is full of contrasts, whether it's night or day, at work or holiday, profit or loss, joy or sadness. It's interesting, the Lord Jesus, he spoke as well, often in terms of contrasts. He spoke of two different men building two different houses on two different foundations with two different results. He said, you are either in or out. You're either a sheep or a goat. You're either on the narrow road or the broad road. A lot of either or comparisons. As we continue in this eighth chapter of Romans, we find Paul doing much the same. He's setting forward contrasting truths. And having a couple of weeks ago looked at the opening verse, if we're in Christ, we're free from condemnation. And then last week, in Christ, we're free from the controlling power of sin. This week, Paul divides the whole world into two contrasting types, two camps, just two, either or. And they have two mindsets, two contrasting destinies that lie ahead. And friends, it's enormously helpful for us this morning because it forces each one of us to ask, Where do I stand myself? And to which contrasting group do I belong? And if I belong to the wrong group, how can I get into the right group? Thankfully, these verses show us how to tell the difference. Four things for us this morning. Firstly, there are only two ways. There are only two. Two ways. Verse 5, Paul sets them out. These two ways, these two ways to live. He sets them very plainly, very clearly. He speaks of those who live according to the flesh. And he speaks of those who live according to the Spirit. Those are the contrasts. Living according to the flesh Living according to the Spirit. He isn't speaking about two types of Christians here. Uh, This is his way of describing those who are not Christians and those who are Christians. Those who live according to the flesh, they're the unbelievers. Those who live according to the Spirit, they are the believers. And there's no third way. Only two ways. There's only one or the other. It's worth noting that God doesn't divide people up by culture or race or educational status. He isn't interested in our possessions or our achievements. None of that matters squat to him, really. The only difference the Lord recognizes is whether an individual is of the spirit or of the flesh. And and when Paul speaks of Living to the flesh here. Uh, Don't think of your skin and muscle and tissue that that covers over your bones. That's not what's in his mind. Uh, He's speaking here of our fallen nature. Our fallen nature. Our our sin-dominated self. So living according to the flesh. Paul's speaking of the person who is living without Jesus. Without hope. And their decisions, their lifestyles are based around their instincts, their desires. That's living according to the sinful flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, they have a, they have a new force dominating life within them. They have the Holy Spirit. Yes, the remaining flesh is still there. From time to time it resurfaces. 
But by and large, these individuals living according to the Spirit are loving the Spirit, serving the Spirit, rejoicing in the Spirit. The two ways, you see, totally contrasting. Flesh on one side, Spirit on the other. And it's not that some days you're walking according to the flesh and some days you're walking according to the Spirit. Uh, no, there's, this is a radical difference between people. You're either dominated by sin or dominated by the Spirit. And as we think of this, I think one of the questions we want to put to Paul is, well, Paul, I need to know what group I'm in. Uh, how do you know what group you're in? What, what kind of evidence should you be looking for, Paul? Uh, what are the outward signs of living uh, according to each camp, flesh, or spirit? And actually, Paul doesn't give any outward signs here. He, he says the evidence begins up here. The evidence begins in your mind. So let's think, think secondly, there are only two mindsets. Only two ways. Only two mindsets. And Paul makes that quite clear in the text. Uh, he's concerned with what we're thinking about. Verse 5 continues. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the thing. Sorry, we go back a little. Those who set their minds on the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And so by setting our mind, it's more than just our intellect. He's, he's really getting at who we are in our innermost being. It's to do with the way we think, but also the things we choose, the things we desire, the things we're interested in. The things we think about when we're not particularly thinking about anything else, the things we drift towards in our minds, our hopes, our ambitions. That's what Paul's getting at when he speaks of our minds being set on something. And again, only two mindsets, he says. The fleshly mindset and the spiritual mindset. The mind that is set on things of the flesh the mind that is set on things of the spirit. To think, of, to think only of the flesh is to think only of yourself. To pursue your own agenda. To look out for your own interests first. There might be occasions when there's fleeting thoughts of others. Morally good actions at times. But the compass of life swings inward when your mind is set on the flesh. Self-satisfying, self-fulfilling, self-exalting. The default setting is me, me, me. Me, me, me. When your mind is set on the flesh. These people, they don't know God. They don't understand God. They're not connected to God. Their mindset dominated by the flesh. But on the other hand... On the other hand, there are those whose minds are set on the Spirit. And they're a totally different category of people. They have a totally different attitude and mindset. They're thinking about the Spirit. They're drawn to the Spirit. They submit to the Spirit. They love what He loves. Their default setting has been changed from me, me, me to him, him, him. It's said, I think I've shared this with you before, that uh, one night uh, the famous Italian conductor Toscanini uh, was leading the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra uh, in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And so majestic was the music, the, the audience stood for 10 minutes of applause at the end and Toscanini took his bows again and again and he went out and in and out and in. The audience just wouldn't stop. And finally, Toscanini turned his back on the audience and speaking only to the orchestra, uh, said to them, Ladies and gentlemen, I am nothing. You are nothing. Beethoven is everything. Beethoven is everything. Beethoven is everything. 
He got it wrong, of course. Beethoven is not everything. But the person whose mind is set on the spirit is the person who says to themselves, I am nothing. But Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. Jesus is everything. And I I ask you, as I'm asking myself, what kind of mindset do you have this morning, friends? Uh, What are you setting your mind on? What is it that absorbs your thoughts? What do you daydream about when you're not thinking about anything else in particular? Uh, What's the default setting of your mind? Is it spiritual or worldly thinking? Because how you think matters. How you think matters. Proverbs 23 verse 7. As a man thinks within himself, so he is. What are your deepest desires, greatest ambitions? What are your most absorbing interests? Is your mindset any different from those around you? Are you living differently from those that you work with and study alongside? Are you thinking differently from those in your wider family circle? Do you have different priorities, different values? Paul's saying here, what your mind is set on, that's going to point you to what you value most in life. Are you valuing the things of the spirit or things of the flesh? Because there are consequences to how we think. And Paul goes on and develops this, having thought of the two ways, the two mindsets. Thirdly, there are only two destinies. There are only two destinies. And he's pretty blunt here. Verse 6. Uh, there are consequences to how we live and think. Verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Couldn't be more blunt really. Couldn't be more clear. If your mind is set on things of the flesh. What's going to happen Death, judgment, and death. But if you set your minds on things of the Spirit, what's going to happen? Life and peace. And the irony, of course, is that those who set their minds on the flesh, they're not waking up in the morning saying to themselves, how can I destroy my life today? Let's see if I can choose things that will will just ruin my life. Let's see if I can follow a path that will lead to destruction. They're not thinking that in the slightest. That isn't how people in the flesh typically wake up in the morning. But God is saying here, if this is how you walk and live and think, ultimately you're destroying yourself and you are heading for death. Proverbs 14 verse 12 There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. The way to death. This is so important for us this morning, friends, because so often it's the people who live this way, the people in the flesh, and they think they are living the life. They think they have it all. And they think that it's these poor people who are living in the spirit who are missing out. And sometimes we can be tempted to think the same. And especially you young people. Tempting to think that the Christian life is the loser life. Paul says it's not at all that way. It's the other way around. If you're in the flesh living according to the flesh. If your mind is set on things of the sinful fleshly nature. Your destiny is death and judgment. And it is those on the contrary whose minds are set on the spirit. Who will know life and peace. Life and peace even in the midst of trial. Uh, And we did read the full chapter. Paul goes on in this chapter to speak 
of difficult trials, of very sore circumstances. And his point here is that even in the midst of sore circumstances, the Christian, the believer whose mind is set on the Spirit, they can know life and peace, no matter what. And they're headed for life and peace. Life with Christ, peace with God. But those in the flesh, there's no life, no peace, not now, not ever. Two types of destinies. Death or life and peace. The Bible doesn't really say anything about a middle ground. Uh, there's no proverbial fence to sit on in the Bible. Just two destinies. Life and peace. The thing is, friends, isn't that what everyone is looking for? Life. People want life. Life with a capital L. Life with purpose. Life with meaning. Life with satisfaction. Life that doesn't depend on drink and loud music and having other people around assuring you you're wonderful. They want life that is contented. Life that is joyous. Peace. They want peace, don't they? Inward peace. Family peace. International peace. All the world is looking for these things. And we've just read the secret. It's those who set their minds on the Spirit. What about you this morning? Can you afford to dismiss these things? What if this morning you were to find what you really lack in life? Life and peace. This is why God sent his son from heaven. This is why he died on the cross, rose from the dead, that he might be a just God and yet still give life and peace. Maybe that's the very reason God and his providence brought you to this very place this very morning, that you might come to know life and peace. There are only two destinies, only two destinies. Only two ways, only two mindsets, only two destinies. Fourthly, there is only one question. There is only one question. And that question is this. How do you change from the flesh camp to the spirit camp? How can you swap sides? That has to be the question. How can you move from being destined for death to being destined for life and peace. Verses 7 and 8. At first glance, they don't give a lot of encouragement, do they? Verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It, those who are in the flesh, cannot please God. We have to get it straight in our understanding. Uh, the, the life of the non-Christian is totally hostile to God. They're against God. They're against God's people. They're against God's word. They don't submit because they can't submit. End of verse 7. It cannot submit to God's law. In other words, in the flesh camp, they don't have the ability to change. And that's why they won't change. They won't turn 180 degrees because they can't turn 180 degrees. By their own will, by their own ability, they can never change. They, can just, they can't do it. There's no power in and of themselves. No ability in and of themselves. Verse 8, they can't please God in this camp. Isn't that a strong statement? They cannot please God, those who live according to the flesh. They might be the best husband or wife you could ever find. They might be extremely thoughtful about others. They might be inspirational in their workplace. But unless they are in Christ, they are unable to please God. 
They can maybe please lots of other people, but not the Lord. What a hopeless, desperate case. The mind set on the flesh, hostile to God, unable to submit, unable to please him. What do we learn from all of that? Is it not clear? If someone in this position is going to be saved, it has to come entirely from outside themselves. It has to come to them from the Lord as a gift, as an irresistible work, as a deep inward transforming power coming upon them. We have to realize that salvation is like rescuing an unconscious drowning man. It's nothing less than the raising of the dead. Salvation entirely of the Lord. Without him, we can do nothing. And Paul has made plain only two groups of people in the world. And everyone belongs to one group or the other. There are those in the flesh and those in the spirit. Those whose minds are set on the flesh. Those whose minds are set on the spirit. There are those headed for death and those headed for life and peace. How can you be found on this side? There's nothing you can do for yourself. But there is one who has done it all. And this morning in the gospel, Jesus offers once again to take your deserved destiny of death. To give you his rightful destiny of life and peace. It could be this morning the Holy Spirit is pressing you about all of these things. We talk of conviction of sin. And maybe you're sick of your sin. Maybe you're sorry about your sin. And maybe you're beginning to be serious about Jesus. If you find that in in yourself in that place this morning, you need to be born again. And you need to throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. Spirit, change me. I need new life. I need a new nature. I need pardon, acceptance, forgiveness. And I can only find that in you. I need life and peace this morning. Because the only other alternative is death. If you do that, you'll find he's able to do far more than you can ask. Far more than you can imagine. For those of us this morning who've done that... It's not a case today of having to be converted all over again. Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? We feel, I, I just, I need to be converted. I need to be converted all over again. That's not what we need this morning. Rather, it's resting in the fact we are converted. Remembering the fact we are converted. Remembering that we are in this camp And God has given us the spirit. He's enabled us to set our minds on things of the spirit. Having previously not been able to please him, we are now able to please him. Isn't that a thought? Isn't that a thought? We are able in Christ to please God. Why is it that some of us are grieving the Holy Spirit then? Why is it some of us bringing shame upon the name of Christ? We are able to please the Lord. Ephesians 5 verse 10. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul will say later in this wonderful book, Romans 12. uh, These might be familiar verses to some of us. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And with these we close. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing 
to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. May God so help us, offering our bodies holy and pleasing to him and being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Amen.